Thank you very much. Uh, post lunch is always a very good session to do. Everybody is uh, not thinking about food. We are not standing between anybody's lunch. So thank you to each one of you and both of you for being with us. Uh, unlike uh, Aisha and Anand mentioned there, uh, two of the most uh, hardworking and two of the people who are toiling very hard to bridge the Indian infrastructure divide. Uh, Minister Goel, if I may start with you, uh, Rise with India is the theme of this conclave. Rise with India is a theme that we at ET now follow. Uh, big believers in the India story. But can Rise with India be possible without the infra deficit being bridged? And, and if I may just also add, uh, the government has taken care of uh, concerns that were in roads, uh, railways, ports, all of that. We need one and a half trillion dollars over the next 10 years to do so. Um, how are we going to execute that? Thank you, Supriya, and thank you, the Times Group, for putting together this conversation. It's really relevant, very contemporary. And I'm glad that we'll have some uh, of the best minds thinking and working this dialogue to get uh, possibly solutions to issues grappling the country. Personally, I've been in government now nearly four years, and I've come to the conclusion that there is absolutely no problem of funds when you do a project right, when you do a project honestly, or any plan honestly, and when one can easily work out what the future holds as an outcome for what you're investing in. Uh, in my earlier stint in the power or coal sector and now in the railway sector, I believe one can very easily work out projects which are economically vi viable. They give you a good cost-benefit uh, ratio. And any project which makes good sense, whether it's for customer satisfaction, whether it's for capacity enhancement, whether it's for efficiency in operation, I believe one can easily work out a business case which justifies investments. And to date, in four years, not a single project I have found money to be a deterrent. If at all there has been a deterrent, it's been our ability to think big. If at all it's been a deterrent, it's been the mindset change that we as a nation need to, all of us, get into our, our way of working, our way of imagining, our way of execution. And to my mind, these four years, we have actually seen a transformational change in the way the nation collectively plans for the future. Indeed. Uh, but before I go to Ms. Kochar, I'll ask you a quick follow-up there. Uh, the government is obviously spending in infrastructure because the public sector investment of growth is the one that's revving. You want to uh, let the public sector uh, channel of investment crowd in the private investments. That hasn't happened. Uh, how long do you see the public sector begin investing and what will incentivize the private sector to begin lose their purse strings? Well, I have been making some assessments of the India growth story over the last 15, 20 years. And one stark reality that comes out is the large amounts of capacities that were created in the 2007, 8 to 2014 period. Very often capacities created on the back of very liberal cash flows being available, very liberal bank credit being available, possibly also the rush to meet targets and uh, achieve larger and larger balance sheets. And during that period, I think on the back of government loosening its purse string, not necessarily in a prudent manner, but in a actually fiscally very imprudent manner. Things like um, uh, letting the fiscal deficit slide up to 6% within the span of a year, literally double of what was projected in the budget of 2008. Now those type of very, very short-term, myopic decisions have cost the nation dear, have cost the banking sector dear. And that's an issue we have had to grapple with, but we've not shied away from that reality. We have recognized that reality. We have faced it up front. We have bitten the bullet. We have not tried to once again push it under the carpet, try and once again hide the story and move forward for the next term to sort out the problem. We've taken it up front. And my own sense is the whole world appreciates that India is becoming a country where you can trust government. India is coming out as a country where processes are becoming more predictable, more simple, more competitive. India is becoming a country where honest business can be conducted. India is becoming a country where entrepreneurs are coming up with new ideas, new thoughts, starting up new businesses which were hitherto not 
traditionally seen in India, and you can see that in the bright minds that India is uh, today producing. Indeed, I'll contend on uh, perhaps one issue which is biting the bullet up front. Many people believe that the bullet should have been bitten uh, three years back and not in the fourth year as far as bank cleanup is concerned. I will come to that. No, no, one minute, one minute. Okay. We've started biting the bullet literally from the day we came in. Whether it was our coal block auctions, which were run in a very transparent manner in a very short time frame, whether it was trying to address the problems of bad asset quality in the banks. Process started in August 15. Now, these are all process-driven things. We are living in a democracy and with a judicial system around us. So you can't have a story where I take a decision and then tomorrow I just say, uh, like a dictatorship or like a communist country, that this is all taken over or this is all sorted out. We have to run through a process, and I think in a process-driven manner, in this short span of time, where we are trying to clean up an inherited story of so many years. Now, I don't want to keep harping on the inheritance, but the fact is that when you are trying to change a billion people's way of working and mind, it's certainly going to be process driven in a democratic setup. So I agree with you on changing the way of doing business, disagree with you on uh, whether we could have done it earlier, and I will come back to you on that. Ms. Kocher, uh, infra lending and to bridge that infra deficit, Minister Goyal says there is no dearth of funds. Indian industry is obviously bought its fingers with overcapacities, uh, projects being stalled. Is infra lending a very risky business to be in? And you know, ICICI Bank has done infra lending. You're not someone who's followed the retail uh, lending sort of a model. Uh, do you believe that's a risky business to be in? And is that why banks are kind of shying away from lending to private infra players? Well, at ICICI Bank, I think we've followed the mixed Shant model. So we yeah. are, yeah, we are also a big retail bank, along with, of course, funding infrastructure projects. Uh, I think on infra funding, there are two things as we uh, you know see going forward that should happen one is that in the past all the infra funding almost has been done only by banks in india and i think the change that has to come about is that we have to go beyond the banking sector so we have to widen and deepen the sources of funding uh, the second is that even you know banks ways of funding infrastructure per se will undergo a certain amount of change as we go forward. So, uh, so what do I mean by these two things? One is that, you know, as banks were funding infrastructure in the past, it was, it was always assumed that as projects will get set up, approvals will come by and by, you know, the backward forward integrations will happen over a period, land will start becoming available, uh, right of way will start becoming available, and everybody started implementing <coughs> projects before the projects were fully structured. And I think that is going to change, not just from the banking sector, but from the entire investment point of view. I think now, as we are talking of the new models, whether it's HAM and so on and so forth, we are saying land has to be available prior, right of way has to be clear, you know, your backward forward integrations have to be clear. So the projects will be much more structured and put in place before you start giving the bank funding. I think that's the change going forward in project finance. The second is that instead of only banks funding the projects and then keeping those loans on their balance sheets for the next seven or eight years, you will now find more and more sources of funding which will come and take on the bank's exposures. And if you see a lot of that is happening now already, you know, if you see this whole ability of the Indian companies to access foreign currency bonds, I mean, lately two airports, uh, you know, one port, all of them have raised almost $5 billion in terms of foreign currency bonds, paid off banks' infrastructure loans. Then you have the ability to raise masala bonds and green bonds. Uh, then you have, you know, things like infrastructure debt funds. Again, almost three infrastructure debt funds, 20,000 crores of funding done. You have structures like in inwits that are now coming into place. Uh, then you, of course, have now NIIF, which has been set up by the government, of course, with an estimated corpus of six billion, but to start with two billion dollars. And then finally, you have the other innovative ways of, uh, you know, the government itself funding infrastructure, like in roads, we are doing the TOT, where you take ready road projects, you auction them out, and, you know, people bid for it, and they pay the government back. So government is, in a way, asset recycling, and the, you know, the buyers are, or the bidders are buying completed projects. And I think the first uh, auction that happened was very successful. The government thought that on those nine roads, 
they'd raise about 6,000 crores, they actually got 10,000 crores, and they have a kitty of another, you know, a lot of roads to be done. So I think these are the structures that can even be repeated in all projects which are completed. So what should happen going forward is that as the projects start getting implemented, I think it would initially be banks who would still give the project loans, but the projects will be structured much better. Then as the implementation is complete, then you will have all these other forms of funding who would come in, pay off the bank loans, and that will actually release banks' ability and exposure to fund the next round of investment. You know, besides funding, I think uh, a lot of credit goes to the government that you've got these alternate sources of funding that have been put. I mean, banks are no longer the only port of call. But besides funding, I mean, one of the things that they say about infrastructure is that the way of doing business has changed. I mean, Ms. Kocho mentioned that, you know, earlier before the project was structured, everything was deemed that will happen. And which, when it did not happen is why we were left with such stalled uh, legacy projects. Uh, do you believe at the heart of the infra deficit is the nature and how the rules of the game will have to change. It can no longer be infrastructure being built the way it was 10 years back. I think it will be a mix of both. There are a number of infrastructure projects which have a social dimension. And after all, every government has to recognize a social requirement of a nation as large as India. Let me give you a simple example. Today we have 115 districts which haven't come up on the development cycle as fast as the rest of India has. We've now taken up a project to take these 115 uh, aspirational districts, as the Honorable Prime Minister calls them, and try and address the aspirations of the people of these areas. We are not making them feel backward. We are giving, them a, a, we are giving a voice to their aspiration. Now, when we talk about that, if a railway line has to go to uh, Osmanabad, or if a, uh, a premium train has to go to Bundelkhand, it's a need that the nation will have to address. And there you cannot look at the profit and loss of that particular department or that particular company. I have uh, said it before, but uh, at the cost of repetition, I, I remember a conversation where we were discussing the coal being given out more to power plants rather than being auctioned. Uh, early years, 2014-15, soon after I became a coal minister, and I literally stopped auctioning coal and giving it out to power plants so that we could have adequate power in the country. And today we are a power surplus country. Seven decades after independence, it took us to become a power surplus country. At that point of time, we lost the auction premium and Coal India profit went down. There were a lot of UN cry. I don't know whether your channel must have also castigated me for that. But suddenly Trust there was enough criticism in. that Coal India profits are down because of this minister. And when I explained the perspective to the Honorable Prime Minister, he made a very, very, very telling comment, which I hope the whole country will keep in mind when we are making policy choices. He said, till when will we keep bothering about the profit and loss of one company or one department? Has anybody ever bothered about the profit and loss of the nation as a whole? And I think that has been the mantra which has driven this government, whether it is the cleaning up of the way we work, as Madam Chanda Kochar just said, after all, the banker-lender relationship, and most of us in this room are well aware, Supriya, you included, that there was a time when a, normally a person would say that if I have borrowed 5 crore, 10 crore from the bank, it's my liability to pay it back. But the moment I have borrowed 10 or 20,000 crore, is a problem of the bank. It's no more my problem, it's the banker's problem to get it back somehow. That rule has finally changed in this country. And promoters, delinquent promoters, are required to liquidate assets. We have a robust insolvency code in place. We have a robust system which is now working. And actually, bankers are seeing the color of money which they had lent out. And very often, there's also a misnomer in society, uh, often uh, amongst uh, even economic experts, about a large part of these loans getting not paid back. But if you look back, the interest rates that prevailed between the 7, 8 to uh, 14 period had shot up to absolutely unviable levels. And that happened on the back of bad government policy. So if you have very high fiscal deficits, Also a global meltdown. Also? A global meltdown. Well, global meltdown was only on two, in the 2008 year in which government did allow fiscal prudence to take a backseat. But if they had used that money sensibly, 
if they had used that money to create infrastructure assets, if they had used that money to strengthen our banks and financial institutions, we wouldn't have the kind of situation we have today. At that point of time, they actually didn't support the banking system to become more vibrant. They allowed the banks to sort out their own problems, which meant more and more evergreening, which meant pushing the problem under the carpet or restructuring assets, but use that money only for political ends, maybe to win an election. But winning an election at the cost of the country's future, mm. I think is an extremely so sad... So now that we are not talking about infrastructure and instead talking on the elephant in the room, which is NPAs and IBC, I must ask two follow-up questions to both of you on this. Uh, I think your worst critics will say the government is going with a very focused mindset to crack down on NPAs. Uh, the IBC code is a step in the right direction. There are two questions there. Is there, a, is there a not a nuanced, do you need a more nuanced approach and not a textbook approach? Because many people believe a blanket ban on promoters and things like that is going to lead to asset value depression. We've already seen a whole lot of litigation that IBC is being mired in. Are those two concerns that plague your mind? And well, I, I agree that it's a new law. It'll take some time to mature. A mm. uh, lot of issues are before the courts and I'm sure the courts will take a very considered and balanced view in deciding what should be permitted, what should not be permitted. But the fact that this was a government which was willing to actually come up with a mechanism which was time-bound, which, uh, which in a way gives the banker an ability to get his money back. After all, all these years we tried with BIFR, we tried with restructuring loans, we tried with surfacey. None of them has worked because of time taken being too long and a lot of messing around with the system. Also, you must bear in mind, one big change that has happened. What Ma Madam Kochard said was right. Bankers used to trust. After all, if you get a coal block allocation and the banker lends money to that company, normally the banker will trust that the government has given a coal block to a company so the power plant will have fuel available. Banker will trust that if a telecom license is given under the seal of the President of India, it will be fair and kosher. But unfortunately, it didn't turn out to be so. And when the courts cancelled all of these illegal, in many cases illegal or improper allotments, arbitrary, without any due process, certainly it was the bankers who were left in the lurch and uh, had to hold the liability of investments having gone into these sectors. Mm. So to my mind, an honest government is something that this nation had been wanting and yearning for for many, many years. And finally, we have a situation where one can trust that government processes are clean, Government processes are honest, transparent, and everything is process-driven, not individual-driven. I can't have Piyush Goel in the room and not have a political ringside view of things. But let me ask you the question that I asked him as far as IBC is concerned and whether, uh, you know, the NPA cleanup is concerned. Uh, the criticism against this is that, A, banks don't have too much elbow room. It's left to resolution professionals and, uh, you know, people like that. Uh, and when you do have elbow room, it's a very textbook sort of approach. You don't have discretion anymore. Uh, and that is perhaps leaving, uh, and, and the collateral damage on account of that, uh, you know, the kind of of rules that are coming in, forensic audit of, audit of 50 crore worth of NPAs and things like that. Is this going to lead to a credit freeze? Are we seeing more and more banks, at least the public sector ones tell us off the record, we don't want to lend. You never know what we really end up with. So first of all, Supriya, I think as far as IBC is concerned, I think that's one of the most important events that's happened in the country that has actually given the power of balance back in the hands of the banks. Uh, because now it's really, uh, you know, as the min Honorable Minister said, it's really a worry for the promoters to say, let me not make a default, uh, lest I will lose my company. And I think that's a very, very positive impact going forward. Uh, well, uh, you know, about solving the existing cases through IBC, again, I think the issue is that it, at least it puts a time-bound approach to solving it. Otherwise, you know, one could go on and on and all. And when there is a time-bound approach, there is really a time-bound kind of, you know, limit on the minds of the promoters also to say this way or that way I have to make up my mind, the bankers to say this way or that way I have to make up my mind, and time-bound decisions are arrived at. Second is, it gives a kind of a judicial cover to the decision, so I think from that point of view, it helps the bankers to decide. Uh, but yes, I think we are still going through that phase where every step of the IBC process is not yet fully tried out in the large cases. And therefore, you will see that at every step, there would be some cases. And I think in the initial times, 
it will be the court judgments that will finally actually make the law. So, you know, at every step, if one has to interpret the law, it's okay, let it go to the court, that will set the precedent. That will then make that the law for the next set of courses. So, uh, overall, I'm very optimistic about, you know, the whole approach that's being taken under the IBC. You know, I and must yes, congratulate... By the way, it has yeah. also left elbow room huh. for honest cases, which there could be, there are many cases where the things are beyond their control or force majeure applies. There's enough elbow room hmm. with the banking system for quick resolution. The problem in the old times was nobody was willing to take decisions. Now, even the bankers are under stress because of tight provisioning norms and all that, they'll have to take decisions. But I do grant uh, one point in your question that yeah, we will have to have a, probably we'll have to be more considerate about small industries, about small and medium industries. We'll have to look at the impact that uh, a large uh, problem has on a series of ancillaries or customers of a large NPA problem in a more liberal or more, uh, uh, more practical approach. And I'm sure uh, the powers that be or the people looking at this must be consciously addressing this. You're leading me to a headline, so I will be led on. And the headline is that there will perhaps be minor tweaking in the IBC norms as far as SMEs is concerned. How I soon do we expect that to I, I happen? I don't know. Uh, I'm not aware of any such tweaking. I'm talking as a co-panelist on a Times, uh, Economic Times uh, <laughs> conclave program, okay. that I do feel that the small and medium industries do deserve a little more liberal, a more practical, and a more... Uh, operationally viable approach. Well, I put IBC and NPA to rest. I think I must owe and congratulations to you. I think the mindset of debt being treated as equity has definitely changed for Indian industry. And I think for that, the credit should go to the government of the day. But let me ask yeah, you... I just make sure. an example just so that uh, sure. your viewers also get to know what is the difference that has happened. Any of you who's been in banking here knows that in the good old days, you'd have a holding company the holding company would probably have, let's say for argument's sake, 100 rupees in his account. On that 100 rupees, he would probably create a story, make the proposal and all, and leverage, and get maybe 200 or 300 rupees on top of that. And then the series of transactions, layering of transactions, which ultimately led to companies with two or three or five percent equity, landing up getting large amounts of debt on series of subsidiaries and advances given to one company, becoming equity for further borrowing. Sure. That whole mess that we saw in 2014-15, when we started looking at where did all this, uh, what happened to the whole system, came, in, came to the fore. And I think this government has tried to do an honest effort to address this problem. We have even brought in a limitation to the number of layers that will be permitted in uh, holding company and subsidiary networks. We have even started looking at data analytics and looking at big data and using artificial intelligence to mine data and come out with what the story is. After all, this is not something which happened over one year or two years. Mm. It's something that happened over maybe 15 or 10 or 15 years. And that's what has to be unraveled. And people have to be brought to book within the ambit of law, not in an arbitrary fashion. So, and while doing that, there may be one or two collateral damages. But I'm sure the people at large will support this move. For the honest, there will always be enough elbow room. There will always be enough and more people to listen to the honest man and solve his problem. But in this government, there will be absolutely no uh, freedom or absolutely no option right. given to a dishonest. Data you mentioned is a dangerous word, so I will make no no mention whatsoever to it. For us, now. it's not dangerous. We use data <laughs> analytics honestly. I, I don't know whom you are referring to when you talk about the dangers. As much you as anybody else. Okay, but I will talk to you on PPT, PPPs and public-private partnerships. You had a Kelka committee report that was put forward. It's an excellent blueprint, they say, as far as uh, uh, you know, reviewing public-private pa partnerships is concerned. Should solve a lot of our infrastructure problems. Why are you not looking into it? Uh, well, we are looking at every report and more often, I think what the bigger problem in this was the predictability, the simplicity of complex regulation and law, which held back public-private partnerships. If I may give an example, in my own railway department, we've been looking at public-private partnership to develop stations and monetize the large lines that we have around stations. Now, the big problem that we faced in that was 
the people's concern, the investors' potential concern, that, look, we don't want to deal with the railway infrastructure. We don't want to be sitting and making the railway stations uh, meet up to the standards that you want and simultaneously do our real estate development. Putting the two together is not working. So we, while, while we, after engaging with stakeholders just like this room, mm. extensive discussions with all the potential participants, we realized that if we're dealing the two, the station development work is done by the railways who know it best. And we give a clean, simple transaction to real estate developers. We can actually double the value of that land and get far better public-private partnership. So it's not always that everything has, has one single approach. Sometimes delinking public-private partnerships can give you a better value and enhance the bankability of that project. And even the bankers and everybody feel far more relieved that the station part the railways is looking after mm. will look after the road part. Uh, the, uh, the real estate part. Mm. Same thing Mr. Gadgari has done very smartly in the road sector. Very often he's given out an EPC contract, mitigated all the development risk, and then looked at a public-private partnership, converting it into a PPP. So I think we have tried to look at all potential reasons, doing a root cause analysis, mm. and finding solutions rather than causing loss to bankers or to promoters. Do you believe that gives you comfort and elbow room, this sort of a review of public-private partnership where you give out contracts and then look at PPPs instead of starting with PPPs that really lead to nowhere? Yeah, indeed. I think, you know, when we look at public-private partnership, the whole concept behind it should be that every constituency should take the risk that that constituency is capable of. And I think that is the big thinking around and should be the big thinking around public-private partnership. So it's not just that there has to be a JV between a public company and a private company. How are the risks divided? And as the minister explained, you know, you look at the railways example that he spoke about, or you look at even the roads example. In Ham, we are saying, you know, the land will entirely be made available and you do only a construction. That's one way of saying, you know, the land risk really belongs to the government. We are not holding that risk. Or then where there is a completed project, then we are saying all the implementation risks are already taken. Now it's really for a financial investor to come and bid and take away the roads. Yeah. So I think when we work on a partnership where the risks that are being, you know, rightly to be taken by that constituency are taken, I think that is the broad meaning of public-private partnership and that is what makes each of those projects bankable. And, and so sure. if I may yeah. add, gradually, Hmm. What will happen after we've gone through this phase? Gradually, even the processes will become more streamlined. So once 20, 40, 60 stations are done, the people will know exactly what has to be done, even in the station development part. So I think at a phase two or a phase three, we may actually be able to give out the whole project. Because by that time, I, we would have defined what is it that goes into station development, what will be the timelines, what will be the responsibility matrix. Hmm. There we can put a defined penalty on, on the railways for not doing it in a proper time or within the uh, available time. And so it can work both ways. Government also taking onus and responsibility. And once that happens, then public-private partnerships will fly almost in every area. I think both of you are making the and point just that... The yeah, other sure. point that I would add is that, you know, sometimes it's just spoken about saying, oh, but where is the private investment? But, you know, we have to really realize that all the government investment is also in some way or the other driving private investment. So now, if we say that in the last 18 months, 1,50,000 crores of EPC contracts of roads were given, they all went to the private sector. So that is leading to business in the private sector and investment in the private sector. Similarly, as uh, you know, railways has now made out its plan, in the next one year, you know, the, the lakh or lakh and a half uh, crore worth of contracts that would go, a lot of it will go to the private sector as well. So the multiplier impact of government spending also should not be ignored because that also goes to the private sector. No, absolutely. I think one example, I saw one of your uh, uh, sponsors over here, mm -hmm. and it was reminding me of the power sector days. You remember the LED bulb program? Now, while on the face of it, it looked like a very small thing, but look at the game-changing dimensions of that small LED bulb program. When we started out, there was a government company which was selling these bulbs, selling half a million, 600,000 LED bulbs in one year at a price which was, they were procuring it at four and a half dollars, selling it much more than a hundred rupee uh, concession or a subsidy that the government would give. Now contrast that to what finally happened. 
you have a nation today where there are 800 million plus, actually 899 million, as of last time when I saw my app, uh, old app, 899 million LED bulbs that have been installed in the country. The total investment in that plan is under $1 billion, only $1 billion. But the nation collectively and all those who are viewing your program have saved $6.5 billion every year out of that $1 billion investment. And then within that, what did the government do? We moved, did the first mover advantage. We gave out the large initial contracts, 50 million bulbs at a time, 30 million bulbs. And at the end of it, out of that 900, 899 million or 900 million, more than two thirds has been sold by the private sector. Government sold only one third and gradually government is getting out of it, moving on to other things. And now the private sector is running that very efficiently. Absolutely. But you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, you're right, one can't ignore the multiplier effect of government investment. Before I go any further, I've got Mr. Dharmendra Pradhan in the audience as well. So welcome sir, to the India Economic Conclave. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, but I will ask you this question. Nobody is, I think, ignoring the multiplier effect. I think the question that a lot of people when they ask about private investment is, yes, the brown field is happening, but the green field is perhaps not happening. When do you believe that will begin to happen? Well, I think it's also a question of looking at the supply and demand. I think a lot of capacity that has been created in the past is still kind of still reaching the 100% capacity utilization level. So I think we have to wait for those to reach the 100% capacity utilization. In the meanwhile, as I said, there is all this investment that is happening, which is being driven as a multiplier impact of, of the government spends. And gradually, as the capacity utilizations go up, I think, uh, you know, the, the investment will come back. But I don't think one should ascribe one reason or the other, say, will finance be available or not. I think finance, as we said in the beginning itself, in fact, you will only see more and more widening and deepening of sources of financing. Deep Fair point indeed. As I wrap this, a last question to you. One year to general elections, a state, of state assembly elections coming up next. People fear, could you be distracted by the electoral process, given how all of you are ruthless political animals, and will all this infrastructure and everything else take a back seat? Just imagine if I had used the word, and the whole shoe was on the <laughs> other end, and I told you that. What would have been? I would have been saddled with court cases. And I take liberties with friends. Times now and ET now would have for the next three days had me on television with this word and maybe you would have asked and what is my colleague minister doing yeah. about uh, this statement. But anyway, uh, on a more serious <laughs> note, I think um, this is another thing that both Dharmendra ji and I have experienced very often in, in our cabinet meeting sure. and it will help you to understand the thinking of this government. There have been more occasions than one when we were taking a decision in the cabinet. And uh, frankly, at times where the entire cabinet, including Dharmendra ji and me, were trying to persuade that, you know, we should defer this decision. Which this ones? The, uh, come on now. Which ones? <laughs> this, is the, this is not the best of time to take this decision. We can defer it by three months or four months. There's an election around the corner, stuff like that. I promise you, every single one of the times such a question came up, the Prime Minister would ask us, Ye desh hit mein hai? is this in national interest? Yes. Is this in the people's interest? Yes. If it is, then the time to do it is now, irrespective of election time. And I think this government will stay the course. This government will continue on this path of giving to the people of India an honest government, a government that is caring for every section of society, a government that reaches out to the poorest of poor, because our philosophy, our ideology that Pandit Dindyal Upadhyay articulated was that the nation's first right on the nation's resources is of the man at the bottom of the pyramid. So will we see Air India being sold before 2019? Otherwise, you wouldn't have had the expression of interest coming out day before yesterday, or yesterday probably, we approved it yes, day before. Day before. Now, if you think this was a government that was intimidated by election and election timing, mm. positively you will appreciate that Air India disinvestment Would wouldn't have come out now. But even in that, it is the interest of the people of India because if it turn around a four, 5,000 crore loss, which it has been doing for the last, I don't know, God knows, 10 years, mm. it's ultimately your money and my tax paid money, which is going in to run an airline inefficiently. Whereas there are businesses which government has no business to be in. So I think we are on the right path, 
each one of our decisions is calibrated in national interest and in the interest of the people of India. And therefore, we don't get intimidated either by uh, Khichdi uh, meetings. We don't get intimidated by any a political, sort, a very big political by any pitch sort of being made here. calendar of political uh, events. Mm. Our job is to govern efficiently, govern honestly, and give to the people of India a good government. And if I may borrow a phrase from the past, a mm. government that works well. Fair point indeed. But we are doing a big gender. We are doing a big gender deficit being bridged here at uh, the economic uh, conclave. And I'm going to give the last word to Chanda Kocher. And uh, Ms. Kocher, are you absolutely convinced with the assurance that has come in from the Honorable Minister and like Aisha described, most agile, a man on a mission, that the government, irrespective of the electoral process, will focus on policy making, decisions being taken, the infrastructure gap being bridged? Well, if the decision maker is saying so, then why do we need to doubt it? On that note, thanks very much for being a lovely audience and thank you very much, Mr. Goel and Ms. Kocher for being with us. It's over to Aisha and Anand once again. Thank you so much, Minister Goel, Ms. Kosher and Supriya.